Hi there! Welcome to this bonus video to part 3 of our logic series. In this video we'll look at some of the basic laws that we haven't seen yet. These laws of thought are even more basic than what we've learned already, but they are quite abstract, so it's good that we've learned a little bit about logic before we introduce them. These laws are axioms. We assume that they are true without any evidence at all. On one hand, you could say that that is cheating if you're creating this logical system that's supposed to work consistently. But on the other hand, we do need to start with some assumptions, and you will hopefully see that these laws are some of the most simple that we can possibly make. If you want to attack these laws, then the question to any skeptic is, what should we replace them with? We can imagine that there might be a logic that works well or even better without these laws, but imagining that and creating it are two very different things. There are three classical laws of thought which we will look at. Extra laws have been discussed on top of this for different reasons. We will look at a couple of the most common of those. The three classical laws are the law of identity, the law of non-contradiction, and the law of excluded middle. These three laws give a basic foundation for our logical system to work. This will be a quick introduction to these laws. Please remember that each of these laws will be connected to lots of history and detail. This will just be the tip of the iceberg. The first law of thought is so simple you might wonder if we really need it, but remember these are our axioms. We must start as simple as we possibly can. The first law of thought says that everything is itself. In more formal terms we would say for all A, A equals A. It sounds trivial, and yes, in most everyday cases you don't need to think about this, but it is an assumption we need to make, and it can be important too. Think about science. The law of identity allows us to say that two different quantities are the same thing for making equations. The object travels one meter of distance in one second of time. This is the same as having one meter per second of speed. Of course, they're kind of the same thing, but we use them in a different way to formalize our system of scientific equations. And it's the law of identity that allows us to do this. The second law of thought is also fairly simple. It says that each thing cannot both exist and not exist at the same time. In formal terms, for all A, A and not A is always false. Again, we need to have this axiom in our system because a contradiction is what shows us clearly that something does not make sense. If we can show that an argument leads to a contradiction, then this is a reason to say it is invalid. We call this reductio ad absurdum, or reducing the argument to something crazy. The third law of thought is a little more complex. The law of excluded middle says that everything either is or is not. In other words, for all A, A or not A is always true. On one hand, this feels right, but on the other hand, sometimes people think they can come up with a counterexample to this kind of law, an example of something that breaks this rule. One common mistake here is to think of, for example, a red fish and a blue fish, and then say that a purple fish is in the excluded middle. If you want, take a moment to think what might be wrong with this counterexample. The purple fish is not red and not blue, this is true, but red or blue is a comparison between A and B, two different things, and purple is a third thing, C. The law of excluded middle is only talking about cases where A or not A, which is, in this case, maybe red or not red. And quite clearly, the purple fish is not red. So the law of excluded middle holds. However, we can use this example to see some tricky cases. First of all, what if you have a fish that is red and blue? If the fish is 50% red and 50% blue, we should probably say that it's not red. But what if it is 70% red? 
or 90% red or 99% red. Secondly, sure, purple is not red, but it's closer to red than blue is. How do you say for sure when a color becomes red? How red is red enough? Both of these issues show us we need to be careful in our definitions because although the law of excluded middle is a law, sometimes it can take quite a lot of effort to correctly even decide between red and not red. The three classical laws of thought can be found in some form in the ancient traditions of Greece and India, although they were not formed into the full system until much later on. Of course, over the years these laws have been discussed and some thinkers have suggested additions to the list. We'll look at two of the most common of these now. The suggested fourth law of thought is the principle of sufficient reason. It says that everything that is, is for a reason or for all real A, A has a cause. We're basically saying that if a thing is real, there is a sufficient condition for it being real, and this is not the same as saying it can be logically derived. This law is what describes the idea of cause and effect, the idea that things make other things happen in a line of consequences. If you look at Wikipedia, you can see three different forms of the principle of sufficient reason, but they kind of repeat themselves. The first says for every entity x, if x exists, there's a sufficient explanation for why x exists. The second says for every event e, if e occurs, there's a sufficient explanation for why e occurs. And the third says for every proposition p, if p is true, then there's a sufficient explanation for why p is true. These are all pretty similar because they are pretty similar. We need slightly different phrasing and parts of speech for slightly different things. But some philosophers try to talk about only one type of thing, phenomena. A phenomenon is a thing that happens, but if we use language carefully, then everything can be described as a phenomenon. Even a proposition in a person's head is the phenomenon of a statement which could be expressed, but right now it's contained in biological data, or something like that. Phenomenology is one of the most abstract areas of philosophy, and also one of the hardest to say. Our final law for this video is called the Law of Identity of Indiscernibles. That's quite a scary name, but we've already talked about identity. It means that things are the same, so the Law of Identity of Indiscernibles means that indiscernibles are the same as each other. So what does indiscernible mean? The verb to discern means to look at or notice, or sometimes to tell apart. An indiscernible is something you cannot discern. You cannot tell the difference between things that are indiscernible in some way. They don't have to be completely the same. Maybe two hats are equally beautiful, or two meals are equally delicious. You can't discern between them in beauty or deliciousness, but you can still see that this hat is green and that hat is pink, or this meal is Italian and that meal is Thai. The law of identity of indiscernibles says that if two things are the same in every possible way, then they are the same thing. If there's no way to discern between them, they cannot be different objects. Again, this seems obvious, but it does bring our attention to look at the ways things can be different, because when we decide that two things are not the same thing, we then have to ask why aren't they the same thing? In what ways are they different? So we've defined an indiscernible, but we also need to ask when we look at the world around us, what is indiscernible and what needs to be indiscernible? Of course, if you have enough detail about the world, every possible thing is discernible. Every snowflake is different, every person is different, every animal is different. Even two industrial products, identical in every way in their production, have to be stored in different locations in space. But sometimes things can be indiscernible for practical purposes. It really does not matter which 100 gram apple you eat 
for lunch, or which bottle of water you wash it down with. More worrying, but still perhaps true, for many modern jobs, it does not matter which individual human does the job, or if a human does it at all. Again, here we see logic and the kinds of argument we make having an effect on the world we live in every day. We can change the way we think about these decisions if we think about the world in a more abstract way. We don't want to do this all the time. Of course, there are times we want things to be discernible. It does matter which human or animal is there to greet you when you come home at the end of the day. On the other hand, though, sometimes we want things to be indiscernible because we want to be compassionate. Humans do some pretty terrible things to people they think are different from them. As you can probably see, deciding when things are indiscernible and when they should be indiscernible comes back to values, which we discussed in the main video. This leads us again towards areas where our laws become uncertain, and so this is where we will stop for now. I'll say again, all of these laws have more detail to them, but those are the basics. And at the end of this video, I just want to give a summary answer to the question, what do these laws do? Again, this is too simple, but very roughly, the classical laws of thought are the foundation for our system of natural deduction, which is the logic we're learning in this series. The two further laws give a basic link between that natural deduction and our world of sense experience and causality that we see around us every day. These are not the only axioms that we use. There are other axioms in the ZFC, or Zermelo Franco Choice, set theory, which is the fancy name for everyday mathematics. But ultimately, all of science and math rests on these axioms. This does not mean that all of science would suddenly become useless if these laws were somehow replaced, but we would have a lot of new questions about the world. Realistically, though, these laws are true and fixed for all practical purposes. So that's just a quick introduction to the basic laws of thought that humans use. There are more stories and history to look into, and of course, much more detail to study. But I hope I gave you a general idea of why these laws are important in the study of logic. Hi, hope you found that interesting. Like, comment, subscribe, etc. If you prefer shorter videos, you can find this cut up on our other channel just up there. But whatever you do, please keep learning something because no matter who you are or how old you are, every day really is a school day. Bye for now.